I'm going to uh, I'm going to read the chapter, but I'm but I'm only going to uh, address the first six verses uh, for this morning. And First uh, John chapter four. Okay, Lord, I thank you for the time we'll have together now, as we consider your word. We'd ask your blessing of what will take place. We pray, Holy Spirit, you help us to be attentive and receptive of what the Lord God has for us today from his word. And we're thankful for our Bibles, Lord, your, your very words to us in the year 2021, this September. We're grateful. Help us to be readers of your word, Lord. Help us to be uh, thinkers about it, doers of it, and uh, by your grace and by your strength, and uh, that it would make a difference in our lives, be a blessing to somebody else along the way. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to be in uh, chapter 4 of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to read the chapter, talk about the first six verses today. Beloved, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby uh, know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that, hath, uh, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and set his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment, have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also, now there's an awful lot of love flying around in these verses, and we're not actually going to address that today. We're going to address the first six verses uh, that talks about a particular uh, topic before the chapter transitions into the topic of God's love for us, our love we're to have for one another, and the love we're supposed to have as believers for God who is our Father now that we're in Christ. But I want to tell you this, according to verses 1 through 6, you can take a peek at verses 1 through 6, especially the first couple of verses, and if you could take a peek at that, you could look at that according to verses 1 through 6. You are not, you are not to believe everything you hear and everything you read. That's right. That's right. And you say, I mean, I'm, I'm asking for you. You're saying, why is that? Why is that, Pastor? Well, the text says, in this context, it says you're not to believe everything you hear and everything you read. And uh, we ask why, because the text says that there are many false prophets that are going out into the world. They have even infiltrated the church 
And so you can't believe every spirit. You have to try the spirits to find out which ones are false and which ones are true. So, so you cannot believe everything you hear or everything you would access as far as information, what you would read, for even from, in our text, from a spiritual point of view. So with that in mind, for a few minutes, I, I want to dwell on this with you, and then, then I'll go on along the way, okay? Uh, for a few minutes, I, I want you to, to stay with me with this. You can't believe everything you hear or everything you read. Now, you probably are aware of what I just said already. You're probably aware of this fact or this truth probably by first-person experience that you've realized along the way and certain things have happened in your life where you realize you can't believe everything you hear and you cannot believe everything you read. Now, if, if you're like me, it's not that you don't want to have a, a, a degree of trust or place a degree of trust in people or institutions or government agencies or even churches. It's not that we don't want to have trust and confidence However, you've already concluded as you walk through the journey of life that you really are an unwise person to believe everything you hear or everything you read. And by drawing this conclusion, if, if you have drawn this conclusion, maybe you haven't thought about it like this and sat down, well, I'm drawing this conclusion, but you, you worked it out. You, you draw this by drawing this conclusion in your life. Uh, I'll tell you what happens. You have adjusted your life to that reality that you can't believe everything. You just can't. You've adjusted your life to this reality, whether you realize it or not. And, and what you've done along the way, and I do the same thing, I've done the same thing, you develop some sort of filtering process or filtering procedure based on who or, 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 or what it is that you're accessing, uh, deciding if it's a credible source or not, that you're able to trust as a standard of reliability, of belief. And then you go from there. And you make informed judgments, judgment calls. And really what you're doing, you're, you're trying or you're testing whatever it is to determine if it's so. And if you're like me, you're having more and more difficulty about this topic as the world turns in our day and age. As our culture is turned upside down, as our country becomes unrecognizable for what it stands for and its actions by its leaders who are supposed to be serving us, you've had more difficulty with this. It's not that easy to decide anymore what to believe as true. I call it, in our day and age, I call it now, I call it the insane saga which is unfolding in our land, in our country. And it continues, it continues with no end in sight. And there's all kinds of information you can access. There's all kinds of people you can listen to, all kinds of authors you can read. But it's hard to decide what is so and what is not so I can conclude what I should believe as true. But you have a filtering process. And the filtering process of... of, of, of that you realize you can't believe everything, you, you got to decide, how, how do I decide what it is I do believe? The filtering process in our day and age has become very time-consuming if you have any sincere desire to, uh, to find out truth to believe it. It's very time-consuming. It's become much more difficult because we're bombarded with all kinds of things from all ways, walks of life, all political positions, and even spiritual situations. 
And if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you'll get weary of, of deciding what it is you're going to believe. If you're not careful, it will become a real burden to carry. And, uh, and if that's the case with you, there's the tendency then that it will wear you down and wear you out. Because you're overwhelmed because how are you going to decide these things? How are you going to have any degree of reliability in someone or something or some institution, some church, you know, what actually is so, so I know what to believe. The beginning of our text says you can't believe everything. You've got to try the spirits, which ones are of God and which ones are not. We try to do this in our lives and, and try to have our feet land on the, uh, on the ground and make sense of the world. It it's becomes difficult. Some people give up. Other people give in. Just go with the tide. Just go along. And that's the end of it. Don't give any more thought. Still others, they, they keep on trying. Keep on trying. I'm going to say this to you, whether you put this in a spiritual context or you put this in a uh, just in a cultural, secular context, I'm going to tell you what, you can figure it out. You can figure it out. Now, there are some things, because of how, how, how things are, that I've decided I have to leave alone until I can access other types of information, hear other people, and I leave it alone. Because there are some things I can't have an answer to right now. But i got enough to go on. I've got God in his word. How about that? Uh, there, there, there is a small group of what I call credible, reliable uh, sources that I've a- I access. They're not perfect like God is, but they're credible. And you, as a whole, you can, you can trust them to a large degree. So believe me, you can figure it out, what it is that you are to believe, just like you can figure it out spiritually what it is you are to believe from our text. Uh, you can figure it out, okay? Even 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 younger kids, you know, kids can figure things out too. What exactly is, you know? May I should I have a little time? Is that clock right? Is that clock right? Quarter of? Is that good? Quarter of? Okay. Now you thought we were getting out at quarter of? No, it just it's quarter about quarter of. Okay. okay. Listen, even even younger people can figure things out. You can figure out a lot more than and, and know what truth is and believe it and act on it. You can. I'll tell you about me and my brother. Me and my brother, growing up, we were buds until we were like in our late teens. And then we sort of went our separate ways because he had different interests and stuff. And it's not because we're at war and we hate each other. It's got nothing to do with that. But as we were growing up, we, we were buds because my brother's only 11 and a half months younger than me. Okay, My mom and dad were busy for a while. But anyway, this, you know, only 11 and a half months younger than me, so we were buddy buddies. But I never say we were bad. We were on me. Yeah, there you go, right, Brian? On me. And when I say my dad, my stepdad, because I knew my biological dad, but my stepdad was my dad, and... Uh, and, and we were ornery, and we, we were all, almost always in trouble for all kinds of reasons, you know. I'll give you one for instance, and, I, and we got to go on. You know, we were always in trouble because, you know, my dad said you can camp outside, but you can't come in. If you want to camp outside, you have to stay outside. You can't come in. Don't be knocking on the door. Don't wake me up. No, wake me up, you know, at whatever in the morning, and, you know, you got to come in the house. So we're okay with that. We went and bought some cigars for the pup tents, you know, and, uh, you know, we're out there and it's, I think I told you this before, it's two or three o'clock in the morning and it got pretty cool out. You know, we had already burned a couple of little logs we had and we were with a couple other friends. And so what I did, I just went to the outside little shed thing where everything was at and I took all his wooden ladders and burned them, you know, to stay warm. To say that we aggravated my dad is an understatement. And uh, so what he decided one time, he's had enough of us. He's going to take us to the farm and leave us there. 
<laughs> you know, me and my brother, you know, I don't know, we're 10, 11, you know, whatever, you know, and we're sitting in a, you know, uh, so he took us to a farm. This little run-down farm, I was like, man alive, who in the world wants to be left here, you know? So we swore we would be what? Good. Of course we did. You know, so we went home. We never had to get out of the car. We didn't get left at the farm. We were, like, all relieved. And, you know, with, within a couple of weeks, we were in trouble again, and uh, he's going to take us back to the farm. He told us once he's going to do it now. And he did. And uh, I happened to see an old milk truck on that farm. And so we went through the farm thing a couple more times, and I realized after a while my dad was never going to leave us at the farm. He was only trying to get us to be good. So, you know, with my little mind, I, I realized you can't believe everything you hear. So we're free to be me. And we were. We were bad. Ornery. So then he decided this. You say, my, my, my dad is trying to figure out what'll work. But anyway, he decided he's going to take us to the police station and leave us there because let the police take care of us. He packed us in the car. We went to the police station. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah, we, we're going to. So after that happened a couple times, we realized, too, that my dad was never going to leave us at the police station, and we could be free to be me, and my brother could be free to be himself, and we'd have fun, some more fun, and not ever worry about being left at the police station to teach us to be good. We realized, even at that age, you could figure it out what to believe. We never believed what he said about leaving us anywhere after that, and that was a big relief. We realized he's not going to leave us anywhere, and so that gave us the green light to go ahead and be ornery and aggravate him over and over and over again. So you can figure it out. You know, you, you can figure it out, you know, what is true and what you should believe and what is not. You just cannot believe everything you hear or read. Now listen to me. This is really important. I think this, and I think I'm right. Uh, you can or you should know much more than you believe. I'm not against you accumulation of knowledge and understanding and, and many, many things. I do my best to have a wide variety of, of, of background. Uh, I'm an expert in nothing, uh, a scholar in nothing. But, but I, I try to have that because I feel the knowledge helps me sort things out. But I'll tell you what, though, uh, uh, but, but you should not be believing everything you know. You understand that? You know a, a host of things, but it gets narrowed down of what you actually will believe. See, there's a difference. Let me tell you something. Uh, belief is sacred. Let's use that word. I usually don't use that word. When you think about believing, how important believing is, even in the scriptures about in the Gospel of John, believing 99 times, belief, believing, okay, believed, okay, is so important. Belief is sacred. Think about that for yourself. Hold your ability and, and your, your volition that allows you to believe. Hold believing close to your heart. Don't give it away so easily. Don't. I don't mean to be a smart aleck about everything. I don't mean about giving people trouble all the time and always pushing buttons and issues and thinking it's funny and you're, you're mocking them and all about, about asking questions and being a smart aleck and, you know, about everything. He was, don't believe anything. I don't believe anything. No, I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about belief is sacred. You ought to hold it close to your heart. Don't give away your believing so easily. Now to the text. I am 
going to talk about the text for a few minutes. Listen, okay, about our text. The text is written to believers, to people like you and me that know Christ. John is writing to believers. John is, calls them the beloved. He calls them beloved in the first verse, talking about those that are in Christ, talking to believers. He said, don't believe every spirit. Don't believe every person who is preaching and teaching. Don't believe every person who, who is, who is claiming to be godly, claiming to share the truths of God, the secrets of God, the word of God. Listen, you don't believe every one of them. Don't do it. He says, don't believe every spirit. And what he says is, do try the spirits. The word is try and attack. Try the spirits to discern if they are of God or not. There's a lot more claimed of God than actually is. Although there's a lot of God around too. But the thing of it is, don't believe every spirit, but do try the spirits to discern what's of God. And, uh, and, and John tells them why I want you to do this. And church leadership should do this to protect the body that, that they're helping to lead under Christ. This is important, but each one of us should do this too. Listen, try the spirits, discern what's of God. You must try because false prophets have gone out into the world and even infiltrated God's church. Try, try the spirit, try the person, try what they're proclaiming, try it, okay? Uh, test it. The try has the idea of scrutinize it. It's okay to scrutinize it. You're okay to scrutinize what I say. I'm okay with that. I have no problem with that. Listen, you should examine, you should examine the spirits or the truth or you examine if it's true. Examine the prophets, the teachers, the preachers, those that claim spiritual leadership, insight, secret knowledge. Listen, listen, try them, scrutinize them, examine them, prove it out. The idea of try means prove it out, test it out objectively. It has the idea, it's got to be objective, and the only objective truth that I know that's actually objective and, and right to reality is right here. The Word of God. Now listen, I have to tell you this. I think bias, so, so in this you don't want to be biased, Bi but bias is a good thing. I'm biased. You talk to me, I'm biased. I'm not going to hide it from you. Of course I am. I have convictions. I, I, I have a point of view that I, I think is right. I'm going to stand by these things. Okay? It doesn't mean I hate you if you disagree. It just means I'm right and you're wrong. No, I'm kidding you. But listen, I'm biased, and I'm okay with that, and so are you. Don't sit there like you're an angel. You're biased, too, and bias sometimes is very good. It's nothing wrong with that. It's a natural thing, but not when used to make truth the enemy of your soul. Don't make me repeat that. Just shake your head. That's even in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Guess who wrote the book of Revelation? The same guy that wrote 1 John. The same one. Revelation 2, 2, he talks about the church at Ephesus. You know where Ephesus is at, right? Remember you cut the turkey in half? Remember? Remember? You cut the turkey in half. Remember on the western half, over by the coast, you have Thyatira, you have Smyrna, Thyatira, and Ephesus on the coast, the western coast of Turkey. The church is there, the church of Ephesus. And it says that the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, that's the Lord who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, talking about the Ephesus church, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast, listen, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So the idea is this, that you should take even things that are preached, things that are taught, even from a spiritual point of view, maybe not from a secular or cultural point of view initially, but I, I think all that bleeds into biblical truth, 
where you're able to take a stand and you'll know what to believe and you'll know what the truth is and you'll know what to believe, but, but try. They tried. These individuals are claiming they're apostles. Evidently, they were false. They were in error. Here, John just says straight up they're liars. <laughs> you know, give them no credibility. Don't trust them about anything. They're false. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. Listen, the issue of the day in 1 John that we're in, in 1 John, in 1 John, the issue they were in about 1 John was whether or not Christ possessed a physical human body when he was here on earth. Okay? Uh, there were Gnostics, and there's a lot about Gnostics, and it's a broad topic or subject, but uh, they, they almost, in, in a nutshell, they almost sounded Christian. They almost seemed Christian, but they denied the truth that Jesus Christ dwelled, dwells in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what they denied. That's what they denied, Colossians chapter 2, verse, verse 9. Basically, the Spirit is good, okay? Matter or material, uh, the world itself is bad. Matter is bad. And God would never indwell or join himself to or with a material body because this great God who is good would never, would never do that to himself and dwell in a mortal body, material body. That's, that's bad. I'm oversimplifying, but I'm stating the truth, the fact. And now you understand how believers of John's day could try the spirits. Do the spirits proclaim what the word of God taught and what the apostles taught, what Christ taught himself and what the prophecies were about in the Old Testament? That God, there would be a God-man, the Messiah, who would be virgin-born, live a perfect life, and die, die on a cross, the God-man, for sins. That's why you can make sense now of verses 2 and 3 of our text, and I'm almost through. Verses 2 and 3 of our text, now this makes sense, because that was the issue. This isn't the only way you, you, you know about somebody if they're in Christ or not, but, but back then this was the issue. Now you can understand this. Hereby now know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Makes sense now, doesn't it? And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. It's against Christ, against his teachings, against the truth that he's the God-man, the Son of God, God the Son, the incarnate Son of God who came, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, to die as the God-man on the cross for our sins. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, verse 3. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world because the false prophets were denying the physical body union of Christ, the God-man. And he says, you're able to overcome this error or any other one to believe the truth. Because he, he tells them in the next verse that, that greater, is in you, uh, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you're able to overcome the error, the falsehood, the false prophets. Because who indwells you? The Holy Spirit. And he's greater than the he that's in the world. He what? The Antichrist spirit, uh, the false prophets and teachers that are in the world. And those of God are able to discern and able to know and able to hear the truth, it says in verse 6, and then actually believe the truth. You guys want to come up? Appreciate it. Okay, actually believe the truth. And now we're back to belief again. And the last thing I want you to think about, once you have discerned the truth and the foundational uh the help of you discerning truth is the word of God. 
When you go beyond that and you're thinking about other issues of your day, you need to access credible, credible, verifiable information to give you a degree of light reliability to go on to discern what it is to believe. I, I can't say any more about that. I have to go on, but because believing is really important. Okay? You knew about Christ before you believed, right? But no one wasn't enough. You needed to believe. It changed your life. It changed your destiny. It changes your life every day because you believed on Christ. I want you to think about, for a minute, and I'm done, listen, about the power of believing. The power of believing, if I put it that way. And remember, and remember, my emphasis is this. You should know much more than what you believe. It should narrow down when you come to believe, because your belief is sacred. Hold it close to your heart. Don't give it away so easily what you believe. Listen, I'll tell you this. However you frame this, you frame it in our, from our text and what we're talking about in spiritual matters. You frame it in our everyday life and just what you access of what the world's happening and what's going on and uh, what, what's appropriate, what's right, what's good, what should be avoided, what isn't true, this is good, this is bad. Uh, you, you can frame it either way, but, but you boil it down to what it is then you're going to believe. The power of belief. Listen, the power of belief, it tells who you will be. What you believe will tell, okay, what you will be in your life. What you believe. Will tell what you will be in life. What you believe, the power of belief, what you believe tells how you will behave in life. It's not what you know that adjusts your lifestyle. It's what you're going to tell, believe as the truth. That will help you adjust your lifestyle through the power of God. Listen, listen, the power of belief, what, what you believe tells what you will bemoan about life, your Christian life, about society, what you'll bemoan. In other words, uh, what you'll be discontent with, what will uh, not be satisfactory for you to follow, what you have sorrow over, what you believe will tell what you will bemoan in life. And what you believe will tell what you will behold in life. What you'll pay attention to. Behold, what you'll pay attention to, what you'll take heed to, what will motivate you and animate you in your life as you live your life for Christ. What you believe tells me what you'll behold in life. So, I'm through, and you understand, and you knew this already. Listen, you can't believe everything you hear or read. Try the spirits when it comes to scriptural things, spiritual things, biblical things. Try the spirits. You have to go to the truth of God. Can't believe everything in the world in which you live and the variety of whatever the issues are. Foundational to all of that at the root, though, is the Word of God, but beyond that, you need reliable sources. You've got to search this out. I can't just give you certain things because then you'll just live on that, and I don't want you really to do that. And sort them out. Find what's credible, reliable, you know? And don't you go through life just believing everything that's presented to you. I would close with this, I guess. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 sums up this whole thing. Not quite in two words like, like Don did about trust God, but, but it's close. It's, it's very kind of like sums up the whole sermon we're through. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 explains it this way. Prove all things. Prove them out. Prove all things. Hold to that which is good.
Let's see. 